Welcome to the Business Titans podcast, where we talk everything to do with growing and scaling your business. And today we have a wonderful, wonderful, uh, let's say, host uh, for you to meet. She is recognized as the Red Shark on Shark Tank. Naomi Simpson is a leading Australian entrepreneur and business leader. She's the founder of Red Balloon and co-founder of Big Red Group, which is the largest marketplace of experience in ANZ and has over 2,000 small businesses as part of their community, delivering over 5 million customers to these businesses. Naomi is also a speaker, blogger, and author of two best-selling books, as well as the host of her podcast series, Handpicked with Naomi Simpson. And you may also recognize her from the wonderful Shark Tank. How are you today, Naomi? I'm pretty fine. Thank you. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, let's get straight into the into the meat and bones of it. I'd love to understand from you, Naomi, when, when did you know you were an entrepreneur? What was going on in your life where you thought, you know what, entrepreneurship is the path for me? I've, I've heard you also uh, state that it is not the easy path. It is actually the hard path. So tell me more about that, that journey. Yeah, I, it's so funny. It's such a label. And it has its meaning has changed over uh, time because when I was growing up in a university, entrepreneur was a dirty word. We were talking about Scase and Bond and other people in Australia who were not particularly famous for being reputable characters. And so I remember the first time somebody called me an entrepreneur, which was um, in about 2003, and I was offended. I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm working really hard and I'm starting, you know, I'm creating my business and I've got a deep sense of purpose. So um, it's it's really only changed uh, the definition this century where it's where it means different things to different people. Um, unfortunately, I think it has a little celebrity attached to it. And as we know, for most people, it's a long, hard uh, journey. It's a, it's a long road. In fact, I don't know any entrepreneur who's ever had it easy. I think that's part of the definition. Uh, and not everybody wants to be or should be or needs to be an entrepreneur. In fact, I, I, one of the reasons I wrote Ready to, Sh- Ready to Soar was because so many people were coming on set in Shark Tank and I just go, this person is not made for this ride. They, 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 it, it's, it's, it's going to be too hard for them. They're not going to have the resilience that's needed and they could lose their livelihood, lost in the passion without necessarily the business acumen. Yeah, absolutely. And so because you, you come across so many different people in, in your walks of life and you have many people pitching you their business, how do you know, like what, what, are the, what are the checkbox going on or the checkbox items that are going on inside your mind to know whether firstly an investor is, is, is fundable and then secondly a business is fundable and a, and a worthwhile endeavour for you to pursue? Look, I, um, I believe that life is short and really we only want to do business with people we want to do business with. And so that for me has always been about understanding people's um, values um, and whether that I can align to those and also understanding their purpose. As I mentioned it just then, it's like people can get so caught up in their own passion that they can't hear, they can't learn. And they um, and the whole per- point about persistence is, you know, you keep your eye on the goal, but you listen and respond, you change, you adapt. And this doesn't always mean that word pivot, which I actually hate because it reminds me of pirouette, which to me is going around in circles. So uh, it's more about adaption and staying customer focused as customers move. So values is important, a sense of alignment and purpose, but also understanding would people pay for whatever they've got? And, And too often people will say something like, you know, I had a baby and I couldn't find organic nappies or, you know, I was designing a payment gateway and I couldn't see that anybody else was doing it. And I'm going, and, you know, because it's really not if you see that there's a problem, it's would people pay to have that problem solved? And and some people really miss that important gem. Yeah, I, I love that. And one of the things as I was going through my research in, in, in to, to, to getting to today was this, this notion of values. You speak about values a lot. And one of my earlier mentors said the word, uh, you know, early in, early in, in my career when he was talking about, you know, how do, how do you build a life of sustainability and how to get your life to the next level? And he talked a lot about values. Values can be a bit of a vague statement. And then I was talking to Julie Batch, who's the uh, chief innovation and strategy officer of IAG. So they're, they're our largest insurer. 
And she and we were talking about strategy and innovation. And she said, there's no point in even aligning a culture or even trying to define a strategy unless you first go through the process of defining your values. And then I come across your research. You're talking a lot about values as well. So what, what does this all mean, Naomi? I mean, v- values can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. Why is it important to define your values? And how do you go through that process of defining the values to build your strategy? Uh, for me, it's about what do you stand for? It's that simple. Who are you? What do you stand for? What are your beliefs? Um, what would you, um, you know, cross over hot coals for? And if you haven't done the thinking about what's important to you, um, then th- you see leadership starts with who you are. Now, I, I, and I've met many a person who once says, oh, I just want to change the world. Well, why? You know, and who are you to do that if we don't know what you stand for? So if you can't enunciate your beliefs and why people should attach to your ideas, then there's nothing to handle on because I'm a nice person. It's not really, it's lots of nice people. There's lots of kind people. There's lots of generous people. So, you know, doing that self-exploration, again, that's what Ready to Soar was about. It's about self-exploration. Who am I to be a leader? Who am I to change the world? Well, let's do the work. Let's do the thinking and let's know what you stand for and your beliefs are before you even get started. Because um, it, it may well be that you're an introvert and that's absolutely okay your behaviors and where is your comfort space but you might find that your passion pushes you into different places so um and passion is an energy it's very personal purpose is about your contribution it's about what you give it's about how you make the world a better place and people can't sometimes confuse them they think oh my my passion my uh, my purpose is um I don't know. Anyway, you see that there is a difference between passion, which is energy and a purpose, which is what drives me to make the world a better place and knowing how you're going to do that. So that's your why. But the values is all about the how. How am I going to change the world? Well, I'm going to do it one step at a time that's focused on integrity or I'm focused on um, enrichment or focused focused on something. Um, And I think that's okay. One of my values is being ambitious. That's okay. You know, why not? And, um, and, you know, the other thing is okay to make a profit. In fact, it's very good to make a profit. You can't change the world if you haven't got the means to do so. So, um, you know, I think knowing that, but I also have a deep commitment and generosity to others um, and um, in who I am and as a leader. So, I, you know, I've done the thinking, know what I stand for, know what I believe in. And, and often people kind of just gloss over that because, you know, they're so worried about the what, what am I doing? Mm. Um, they, you know, Senek's been saying for a long time, but even before that, there was all about purpose. He kind of had latched onto it. There's always been about, you know, the why, but it's also the how. Yeah, absolutely. And so what, what, what advice do you give to people in terms of how to go about that personal discovery? Because, there can, be, there can be multiple layers of why, and sometimes we can think we know why, but it's a superficial reason. I'll give you a quick example. I used to think I'm going to change the world because that's just that's what I want to do, and that's the way I was raised, and I thought I'm going to change the world. And it was, it was, it was a false sense of, of belief, and when I, when I delved into that, there was some deep emotional pain that I was holding on to as to the reason why I wanted to change the world. I felt powerless growing up as a kid and therefore I wanted to change the world in order to feel that sense of power. Now, I wouldn't have gotten to that level unless I really worked on myself and really got down into the trenches of what's going on in the emotional space. What, what, what advice would you give for people that, that, uh, that need to go on that journey of self-discovery? Because I find it's, it's not something that everybody does. It's not just the walk in the park that you go and do and tick the box. And there's plenty of kind of um, programs you can do like there's a plenty of those sorts of things that are available you know many have done the Tony Robbins work or the landmark forum and there's lots of things in terms of that but that for me there's this just one simple question and that is but why but why but why and and if you I think it's important that we all have somebody to challenge us to greatness somebody who won't believe our own bullshit um, somebody who'll stand up to us. Like I, I'm a highly convincing person. Like, you know, I know how to string a few words together and, um, and I, I have such a strong conviction when I speak 
people are just like, well, okay, that's the truth. So I need somebody really strong to say to me, but why, why? And really challenge us. And I think that that's the first step in self-discovery is who won't believe your bullshit uh, when you want to tell you that. And the, I guess the concern that I have, this is two kind of schools of things. We're very busy telling kids that they can do anything they want in the world, which is fantastic. But then we were also ending up with people who believe they can do anything in the world and that they're entitled to it because they've been always been given a prize when they did a competition. So it's this notion of resilience that for me is missing. So the resilience, responsibility, respect, those sorts of words that we often don't speak about. And yet that's what's real, really missing. So you are not entitled to be a world leader unless you've done the work and you've earned it and that you have the respect and you have the authority to do so. Um, and it really worries me that on LinkedIn, you know, in the beginning, there was only 150 of us, I think, who were writing around the globe because it was based on some level of authority, something that we had done, we'd achieved uh, versus now anybody can write anything um, and, and, and on what basis? And this notion of fake news, it's also just fake information or it's my opinion and therefore it's right. It's just, it's exhausting. And um, so, it, and I think it's challenging. So anybody who wants to be a, a leader, fabulous, great. Now earn it, show us why and earn the authority. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've referenced some of these. Uh, I love your ability to put things in frameworks and, and like respectable, responsible. You mentioned that these were so respectable, respect. Respect, yeah, respect. I'm assuming we're all respectful. Yeah. And and so you've you've mentioned uh, in, in another one of your interviews that they're some of the some of the traits that you leave with your with your with your children. Do you find that that those traits are what you need in leadership as well? Is is there a synergy between how you raise kids and how you how you build a business? Um, of course, I, I, of course. You know, we are one pe person. We're not a business leader, and then we're a parent. Um, we're just one person, and knowing and and I think consistency is everything in parenting, um, mm -hmm. and and pro providing a framework for kids of what's just not negotiable, um, and not giving in is is really really important i'm actually traveling in new zealand once with the kids and natalia she's my daughter she's just challenging me challenging me challenging and i just said if you do this i'm doing that you touch your brother one more time you are literally in the doghouse and um and she's never been more shocked in her life she still remembers it because i followed through and i think as a leader you need to follow through you just got to do what you say you're going to do. That was one of our first values in, in the business way back when. Just do what you say you're going to do. And if you can't get it done, then make sure you tell people why you can't get it done. So you haven't just pretended it. I never said it. No, no, no. I couldn't get this done because X, Y, and Z. And then you can stay focused on the power of your word. People underestimate the power of their word. If there's one thing, if anyone wants to just piss me off, just, don't, just do one thing. Say one thing and do another. My father used to say to me, I can't believe I'm telling it. He used to say, um, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> oh, my God. And I, I still struggle with it. I'm like, that, that's not even funny. I mm. just, you know, who you are, your behaviors, everybody is watching the whole time. And as a parent, this is in one of my podcast episodes. In fact, it's this week's episode. Nice. No, it's not. No, it's not. Anyway, it's coming up. But yeah. this woman, she's got an amazing business. She's running it really hard. She's doing everything. And then right at the end of the podcast, she says, I've got two small children. I just feel like I'm never with them. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the most important part of this podcast. Let me just tell you one thing. As a parent, if you are always on your smartphone, what do you think you're teaching your child? Don't expect them to speak to you as a teenager. Like, watch what you do. Everybody is watching. I wear glasses. And I'm too vain to wear them on the telly and everything, too vain to wear my glasses. So I'm always frowning because I can't see. Well, people just think that I'm in a bad mood all the time until somebody said, don't you like me? And I go, no, I just can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> and I realised that people are reading my face all the time. Yeah. And I just had to be so self-aware of how I present myself because it could be, 
a taxi driver. It could be like I have random people coming up to me on the street and saying, oh, because of you, I did this. So I need to be who I say I am. Doesn't matter if I'm having a bad hair day, like literally in lockdown in Sydney, pretty easy to have a bad hair day. Um, And so, you know, the face and how you present yourself, which is just what the red jacket's about, because people know consistently that's what they're going to get. Okay, it's her. We get it. We know what she stands for. Yeah. And and I love that that approach, especially with with the children, because it, it helps remove that sense of entitlement that even our employees can have, our kids can have it, our employees have it, uh, depending on, on the way we were raised and the values that our parents taught us, like the example you gave of, of, of your father of, you know, do do what I say, not what I do. And it's it's so powerful to set the right example. How, how do we go about reconciling? So, you know, I work with a lot of CEOs that set these huge ambitious goals that may almost be too big and, and unachievable. So how do you go through that process of reconciling the vision and the strong power and the strong sense of purpose that you have? And when you look at the reality, you look at the today, sometimes it can drive that unsatisfaction. How do you reconcile that, Naomi? Oscar, I'm just loving this interview. Just <laughs> so you know. Because I'm about to say, oh, did you listen to my podcast yet again, handpicked? Because I did this whole one on goal setting because right now, if you're in business, it's really hard because if you're setting a plan and then you don't know any of the external factors, you don't know, like logistics is so hard, like Mm. import, export, um, labor, uh, people, right people. Like it's it's almost impossible to set a plan. But this is not a way somebody can run an effective business without being able to have some level of planning and forecasting. And so goal setting becomes really, really important. There's a flip side to goal setting, which is also about how you feel, Mm. how you feel accomplished. And so when you set a goal that says, I want 10 million people by blah, 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 blah. Now we know about big hairy audacious goals. I set them myself, set one back in the early days in Red Balloon in Big Red Group. We've got an amazing big hairy audacious goal, but it is possible, not improbable. And there's a difference. So of course, it's got to be hard. It's got to be a, a stretch but it's not impossible. So I once met somebody who was doing children's books and she said, I want every child in Australia to have one of my books. I was like, it's never going to happen because as soon as you want somebody grew up and then there was another baby. So you never can get there. And so you've set yourself up to fail and you'll never get that sense of accomplishment. Setting a goal is about winning. It's about achieving. It's not about setting something that is so easy in you and your heart it was never a real challenge it's about aligning people focusing people setting your sights on something and then really celebrating it I was talking to a New Zealand friend actually recently and she was setting sales targets for a team and she said no no I they always tell me what they want and I always give them 10% extra and I said how often have they got their 10% extra and she goes never I go wow I'm glad I'm not in your sales team you know we want to be winners um, so there's this also this notion of, have you ever heard of list bias? This is in my podcast and I talk about this sort of stuff because it's really interesting, list bias. So some people write lists. Some people will write things on their list that they've already done so they get the pleasure of ticking it off. <laughs> Most people, when they write a list, and I know that for myself because I've got my list right here, um, they'll go to the things that are easiest to get done because it makes them feel good. Mm. Unfortunately, that means they might not be working on the big things that they need to get done. So um, so setting goals in this time, and that's why I've been doing these daily kind of quick fixes on handpicks, like just do this today and get this done. And, and it's very, um, I, I don't know, very, not basic, but very tactical and practical because we, in this time when it's really hard to feel like a winner, you got to feel like a winner. And how you set goals is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, f- I fully agree with that. And you've got to set goals that you can feel the success of rather than uh, set- setting yourself up to fail. Big believer in that. Now, you've said, Naomi, uh, in-, in the past, in one of your other interviews, that uh, finding customers is-, is one of the hardest things to do as a business. Now, you've delivered fi- over 5 million uh, customers to some of the... Uh, eight. Business- Never mind. It's just eight. another 3 million. <laughs> eight. Eight. Well, I'm thinking- just serving about well, more than a million customers a year now. So it's like, it's pretty, yeah, way more. 
Yeah. Massive. Yeah. So eight million. So I, I redact that and I insert eight. Um, what what's the secret, Naomi? What's the secret to you know if there's a business owner that's watching this and going, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not working. So you want twenty five years of marketing experience in one answer? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, look, what am I going to say? One is, um, you just must understand the cost of acquisition of a customer. If you don't understand what it's costing you, I was speaking to somebody recently and she said, you know, we got X number of customers for our product. They spent $500 each of them. And I said, what was your cost to acquire? And she says, well, I don't know. And I said, well, I'm not just talking about your promotional costs. What about your talent costs, your people costs or your time? Because that has such a material value to it. It's the opportunity cost of what you could have been working on. So if you're not looking at your overall cost to acquire and your lifetime value of a customer, that is, you might acquire them once, but if they stay with you for 10 years and they buy from you all the time, that's a worthwhile investment. But if you're having to apply every customer one by one, it's not often I talk about other people's businesses, and I don't know if you know this business called Shoes of Prey, but they went out of business about three years ago, I think, or two or three years. Uh I knew the founders, they're good people. Um, the, the thing was though, I always knew that they were going to go out of business and I would had some dealings with them. I bought their product once it was kind of fun, but I would never buy them again. And, and going into the U S where everything is, you know, sale or return, plus you have to pay for the shipping and their unique product that when you return it, you can't sell it to anybody else and it becomes landfill. So ecologically and as a, as a social responsibility, it was, and as people were becoming more and more aware of that, it was getting more and more pear-shaped. I just knew because they were having to buy customers over and over again because people weren't coming and buying one pair and then they were going, oh, I'll get another pair. And so for me, it's, you know, it's get one customer, make sure they're an advocate, tell everybody else, and they're going to drive customers for you. Okay, I tried to give you 25 years of marketing experience in two seconds. Yeah, for sure. And, and that, that, you know, that covers some of the more operational aspects of, of, of the business, right? That's more the, the business model. How does that work? What, what, what about in terms of, of messaging and getting your, getting your voice out there, carving, you know, we hear this notion of carving your own lane and swimming in it. What, what are some of the other more, you know, marketing centric or, or the emotions or the feelings that you really need to consider when you're building a brand? So you've got to understand what ro- role, what job you're being hired to do and what role you play for your customer. And there's three primary reasons. There is transactional. You were just at the right place at the right time with the right product and it filled a particular need and they want to have no other connection with you. It was just convenience and that's okay. But it means that you have to keep finding or being convenient a lot. Um, And were you memorable enough that they will come back to you next time they need a transaction? So ideally, you want them to have some level of emotional connection to your brand, that they feel something and that they um, you're not just fulfilling a transactional purpose, but you're also filling an emotional need. That is, I feel better. But the third one and the ultimate one is also about social. It's about, it's not just about how do I look, but did I, did I contribute to the society because I've used my money and my buying power in the right way and I've made a social contribution and I look better, I feel better and I am better because I bought from this brand. So you would argue that there's, an, a, there's a hierarchy or there's a, there's a journey of emotional connection that people may or may not have with a particular brand. And it's okay to be anywhere. And also not all your customers are buying in the same spectrum all the time. So you might have some who just want to transact and others who want to feel good and know that they've made a social contribution. So it is a spectrum and people will be at different places on the spectrum. Mm. And then do you create different marketing messages around where they are on that spectrum? Of course. 
Um, and, you know, personalized marketing has been around forever since I started in direct marketing, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and people expect to be treated as individuals and the brands are not treating them as individuals. They're getting pretty kind of, you know, you, you should know me by now. I've, I've already bought from you once. Now, mm. now tell me what I should be having now. I want you to help curate for me. Um, and the language you use, uh, we did a lot of work on this. And I know that back in the early days of being in a two-dimensional uh, website, our number one job was to build trust. And they just, and that's what, you know, wearing a red jacket, oh, it's her, we can trust her, we know what she stands for, blah, 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 blah. It's about building trust uh, for your enterprise. And trust is needed now more than ever. Yeah. Um, when we may or may not ever meet our colleagues, our customers, our channels, our distributors, our community, we might not ever meet them. And so um, trust uh, is very, very important. And, and that comes back to the language and the storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. There's some, some really uh, solid points there, especially around storytelling, connecting emotionally. What's, what's, what's an example of, of something that you, you know, in, in your marketing career, what, what's one of the highlights for you in terms of light bulb moments or where you applied a fundamental and thought, wow, I, I can't believe it's that easy. Are there, are there any thoughts that you can, you can, uh, or any fundamentals that you can think of that really were, were so impactful that you had to implement them every single marketing campaign for the rest of your life. Are there any moments like that? No. Um, <laughs> no. no, you know, in fact, marketing as a discipline is so much more sophisticated than when I started. And mm -hmm. it's a melding of ideas and analytics when the two come together and the sheer investment that we now make on the storytelling, the brand essence and all of that sort of thing. It's, it's, I marvel at our team. They're just amazing. Like they blow me away. I'm just like, oh, I used to just do this little thing and blah, blah, blah. So it's all moved on. It really has in terms of sophistication. Mm. What has not changed is the value of the brand, how people feel and that brands are created in the hearts of customers. You don't create a brand, you create a story that people may or may not feel something. The brand is held in the hearts of your customers. And so therefore, if you remember that, then the way you communicate or the way you trigger or the way you get people to respond, um, and especially for many enterprises, often customers wanna be the heroes in the story. You know, I mentioned that, you know, we're delivering a million customers or more to small businesses in Australia and New Zealand. And, um, and we only get to do that because people have purchased. And so we're really, really clear and we're humble in our role and that we thank them. And we say, because of this, a small business gets to have a customer and that impacts their community. And this is how it all works. And we know that for any customers that we're spend, sending to regional New Zealand or regional Australia, it's, it's, you know, it's a 10 times multiplier. They spend money on accommodation, on food, on wine. On, and all of a sudden, that's, that's a real economic impact. So we know that we're that conduit. And often, of course, the cust customer doesn't know that, but we add that social, social um, value or currency. To what yeah. we do yeah i love that i love that so let's um so we've talked marketing and, and thank you for sharing some of those uh wonderful insights and experience i think there's so much to digest there for the people watching um now let, let's talk a little bit about your book ready to soar uh it's really about helping people align whether this is the right road for them and and i've heard you state that early on in your journey you went to get red balloon created you spent about twenty five thousand on it and and had a website that wasn't, uh, you know, that, that somebody stated as, as an example of one of the worst websites, right? This must have been shocking, gutting. Uh, it must have been really hard to hear because you would have made a big investment in that. I mean, where to from there? How do, how do you handle those hits as an entrepreneur? What was it like at that time? And how did you how did you pick yourself up and dust yourself off? Most people would give up at that point is my, is my point, right? How, how I don't do you know. You know, the, the reality is life for me back in those days was a blur. It was just a blur. I don't know what I was doing. And the, 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 you know, I had two small children who may or may not have been sleeping through the night. And I, um, 
you know, they'd get grumpy because I'd send them to bed at five o'clock because I have work to do, whatever. Anyway, they bought themselves up very nicely. They're both very successful adults and um, they're fine. So I guess the point is you do just keep picking yourself up. It, it, many, many things didn't work. And they, uh, I remember somebody saying to me, it might, might be a very expensive lesson, but what did you learn? So for me, it, the most important thing is to reflect, is to have that time to say, what did I learn from this? Because we're so busy doing. It's like, a, oh, I've got to go through my e emails. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. We're rushing to these urgent things. We're not working on the important things. And you have to have the time to be able to breathe, to work on the important things. And, um, and everything's always urgent in startup land. But how do you prioritize on what's important from what's in urgent? Because you'll have everybody else telling you what you should be doing or do this now or do this now or do this now. Um, so, yeah, I just, I, I guess I was always rushing to the urgent. So I don't necessarily think I'm a particularly good role model in that. But I achieve things. But I think that moment of calmness, reflection um, might have served me as well. Or having somebody else to kind of hold up the, hold up the you know, mirror and say, really? Yeah. whatever you know so i think that could have been a useful thing too but um in ready to soar is quite deliberate about putting exercises in there and it's, i've i've got a few mentoring um clients that i do now like startups that i'm really interested in and so forth and i always make them do the book and they say why isn't it an audio book it's because i want the kinesthetic of them not to have a passive but to have a participative role in the book and then to do answer and take the time to fill in the the you know the questions and think it through so that it's kind of, you're active in the process rather than passive in the process. There's a lot of there's a lot of business books, and if there's one thing that you've learned from watching Shark Tank, that you know we're only five different ways you could start, run, and scale a business. All of it, all of us have a different opinion, and that's what's interesting. There is your way, but you've got to find your way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love that. And I agree with that. So tell me a little bit more about your, your podcast handpicked and how can people uh, get access to this? Oh, it's so easy. All you got to do is search on a great podcast uh, network, Apple or um, Spotify, or whatever, just search under um, handpicked Naomi Simpson and just download it. And it's weekly. And I do these extras, particularly when things are going on. As I said, there's a lot of challenges for business owners uh, right now. And if anybody wants um, a copy of Ready to Soar, um, best place to get it, um, or my other book, Live What You Love, is to come to naomisimpson.com. Um, that's no P, naomisimpson.com. And just in the bookshop there, you can um, grab a copy um, and, and keep going, you know, keep going, keep growing. And I think yeah. that's fantastic. And you can get Naomi's art as well, I believe. I was, I was seeing some art that you're, uh, you're spending some time painting, Naomi. <laughs> I always wanted to be an artist. And finally, I'm painting and I've got a body of work together and I've got an exhibition coming up. So, yeah, wow. I built myself a little website and I show it to people. And I've sold a bunch, which is kind of cute, which my husband's so grateful for because we've got artwork throughout the whole house. And he's like, seriously, sweetheart. Um, you've got to move some of these on to, you know, let them give joy elsewhere, he says. He's so funny. So, yeah, that's Naomi. And you can, there's a link on my naomisimpson.com uh, website because I think it's important that people see that we're, there's more sides to us. You know, we're parents and we're, you know, and I paint and, you know, we're family and we're friends and as well as being business leaders, we're whole people, not just uh, single-minded and, you know, obviously yeah. I volunteer a lot. I'm on the cerebral palsy board. I'm on university boards. You know, it's not just, it's not just all work. Um, I'm not just all entrepreneurship. Of course it was uh, for many years, but the business mm. is, is, and I don't have an executive role. It's fantastic. I'm a non-executive director of my own businesses, which I do with David Anderson, my business partner. He yeah. of course has an executive role. He's the CEO, which I love. <laughs> yes, he's on the hook for delivering. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's fabulous though. Yeah, wonderful. And so let's say somebody wants to uh, attract an investor to their business. What is it that, you know, what's the, what's, what's, what's really under the hood here in terms of, you know, what's going on in Shark Tank and in your own personal life? 
What are you really looking for in, in, in a business to know whether you're, you're willing to invest? Well, I still do help people. Um, if I'm not interested, if my dance card's full, which is fine, but I do refer them. And I've got a bunch of different sorts of investment um, arms from angel to um, growth uh, growth finance to, um, you know, I've got a VC stuff. So I've got a bunch so if people are looking for funds and they inbox me via my blog, um, if I'm not interested, I'll refer them to someone else um, because I think that's important too. Uh, and But they need to be pretty clear about um, their ask. And I we like to see traction. We, it, it, funding pure ideas. Uh, there's one one group that I work with that might do that um, and actually they're funding one out in New Zealand at the moment but um, uh, it, it's mainly uh, you know have you got a bit of traction are you getting a few customers through your website if we added some money to this could we scale and we definitely like to see that founders have got some good skin in the game yeah absolutely wonderful well is there anything else you'd like to share with the uh, with the audience or anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you Naomi um, look, I think this too shall pass. Uh, nothing is ever as bad or as good as you think it is. And it's absolutely okay. So I have a personal motto. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. So I know I'm accountable for my own future, which can be challenging when we think things are out of our control. But there is so much you can control and reflect on the things that you can impact, not the things that you can't. I love that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your generous time with us, Naomi. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. My pleasure.